let your energy settle into your body. Feel yourself going inside. Relax your face and jaw, your neck, and the rest of the body. Shoulders and arms, chest and abdomen, legs and feet. Now directly behind your heart on the top left side of your back, visualize a closed pink rose. and visualize the rose opening slowly until it's fully unfolded, so slowly, so gradually. Feel the energy of healing love and compassion emanating from the rose, a white light Allow the white light to fill your entire body, bathe your body and soul in the energy of love and compassion. Stay in this state for the next few minutes. Now expand the light out of your body to your room, your house, the city, the planet, and the universe. Everything so connected. Slowly come back into your room, into your body. Wiggle your fingers, your toes, feel your hands and arms, the rest of your body. Breathe a few cleansing breaths, deep cleansing breaths. Come back and slowly open your eyes.
Good morning. Today is the 21st time I'm celebrating Father's Day. Time flies. I remember so well the birth of my children. So last year, I spoke about my birth father, Milton Katz. And this year, I'd like to speak, speak briefly about my children and stepfather, Cy Hertz. As some of you know, I have two beautiful children, a son, Zachary, who's 20, just finished up second year engineering at university, and a daughter, Nicole, who turned 18 a few months ago, and just graduated high school. She set her sights on health sciences. I salute both of them, especially Nicole, who's had to graduate at a time when it's so difficult and she's gonna be missing out on so many things. Though sometimes challenging, raising Zach and Nicole has been one of the most rewarding and transformational experiences of my life. Although I would not want to relive some of the challenges of being a parent in their early years. Every once in a while, I just kind of wish I could spend another week with them again when they were children. It goes so fast. One of the lessons that I've learned in the past year, especially with Zach, is to let go and acknowledge that he's his own man at age 20 and that relating to him in a parental way just doesn't work. Now I'd like to say a few words about my late stepfather, Cy Hertz. I met my stepfather, Cy, in 1991 at a weekend brunch at my mother's home in Montreal. My mother and Cy, who were second cousins once removed, had gotten together 35 years after ending an intense relationship from when they were their teens. After their teenage relationship ended, Living in New York, my mother in Montreal, Cy went on to become one of the top lawyers in Manhattan, specializing in mergers and acquisitions, and practiced for five more years after his marriage to my mother in January 1993. He had the good sense to retire when he was in his 60s so that he could enjoy his retirement years. As a stepfather, he was loving, compassionate, generous. He had a great sense of humor. I couldn't have chosen a better second husband for my mother. He also made a huge difference in my life. Sai so suffered with health issues late in his life and sadly passed away last month on Sunday, May 24th. His heart just stopped. I'm so grateful that my partner Izzy had the chance to meet him and get to know him. And now to my main topic. Transformation is a way of being and the connection to the five unity principles. So let's re briefly review the five unity principles, all of, all of which are very relevant to my presentation. The first one is God is the source and creator of all. There is no enduring power. God is good and present and everywhere. Two. We are spiritual beings created in God's image. The spirit God lives within each person. Therefore, all people are inherently good. The subtext there could also be we're spiritual beings having a human experience. Three, we create our life experiences through our way of thinking. Four, there's power in affirmative prayer, which, which we believe increases our awareness of God. There was a meditation experiment and 4,000 people from 82 countries meditated for six hours a day for just over 50 days. This resulted in 23% reduction in violent crime in the immediate area. And the fifth one, knowledge of these spiritual principles is not enough. We must live them. We must do everything we can to live them. So the power of transformation lives in these very principles. 
all life by nature is transformation in action. Everything on the planet is perpetually transforming by default. There's no escaping it. Throughout the process of life and transformation, we have the power to choose to focus on what serves us instead of focusing on what doesn't serve us. And this connects us to unity principle number three. We create our experiences through our way of thinking. For when we're deeply committed to focusing on what serves us, viewing transformation as a process and way of being, rather than a destination to arrive at, will result in what I have found to be a happier, more peaceful and satisfying life. And life isn't without challenges. When challenges present themselves along the way, and by the way, no one, no one on the planet is immune to challenges. Everybody has challenges and pain. When they're really bad, everyone asks, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to me? And what if we empowered ourselves and asked the question, why is this happening for me? And if we commit to focusing on enjoying the journey rather than focusing on a final destination, we're in a perfect position to create goals and milestones along the way. Once we achieve a goal or reach a milestone, then we can generate another set of goals and milestones to move towards. Many people, many famous people go through intense transformative periods, moving from great pain and disarray in a toxic lifestyle to a peaceful, healthy life. This is the classic image of transformation that many of us associate with the word. I assert that once someone has cleaned up their act, if they've learned from the process, they'll continue, continue to move up the devel developmental spiral. A perfect example of this is one of my favorite musicians, James Taylor. James was a, was a heroin addict until the age of 35 when he got sober and he's remained clean and healthy to this very day. For James, it was the death of his good friend, John Belushi, that was his wake-up call. He's written a song about it called That's Why I'm Here. He continued to develop as a person and a musician, and a whole new gregarious and witty James Taylor emerged compared to the withdrawn and introverted action, an addict that he was. If, uh, if you have a chance on Audible, um, On Audible, uh, the audio service, there's a wonderful 90-minute audio book that he narrates called Breakshot, which is about the first 21 years of his life, his parents, um, his siblings, his relationships, and also his struggle with addiction. Um, it's, it's a really, really interesting listen. Now let's talk about lifelong learners, triple L's as I like to call them. They're driven by an intelligent curiosity. Triple L's live their lives knowing that learning never ends and does not seem to have to end, which is why in every university, you'll see some people from the 30s all the way up to their 90s taking elective courses, auditing courses, and pursuing degrees in higher learning. This is the very impulse that drives people to learn new things, new skills, to speak a new language, to learn to fly a plane, to learn an instrument. There have been two people in my lives who have just really exemplified this. One was my guitar teacher, Shirley Brown. She's in her 90s. She's still alive. I've known her since I'm 10 years old. And until a few years ago, she was taking university courses. Uh, even when she was blind, she went mostly blind and she was taking university courses. The other person was a man named Ellie Rubenstein, uh, a conductor, composer, um, big band leader. I played in a big band that he led. Um, and in his 50s, picture this, I was studying music at university and taking psychology as my elective. And all of a sudden, in a historical perspective of psychology, Ellie Rubenstein in his 50s shows up. And this man did his psychology, de psychology degree, pivoted from a, a career in music to a career in psychology, became a, a therapist, really, really good therapist for the rest of his life. 
So these lifelong learners are consciously or unconsciously committed to their transformation. They reach a milestone and then they generate another milestone to move towards. Now the following is one of the power, most powerful quotes from the Conversations with God series that sums up the concept of transformation as a single sentence. The purpose of your life is to recreate yourself anew in the next grandest version of the greatest vision you've ever held about who you are. I find that to be one powerful inspirational method, message. But as we all know, transformation is not always smooth and comfortable. Even in the midst of a dark night of the soul, we can reframe our experience as a part of a larger process of transforming and recreating selves, ourselves anew in the next grandest, grandest version of ourselves. Many spiritual leaders on the planet point to the fact that life on earth is brimming with contrasts, light of day and the dark of night poverty and abundance, love and compassion, and the absence of love and compassion. Now, this everyday reality of this contrast will mean that everyone on the planet will experience pleasure and pain, happiness and sadness, success and setbacks. For me, we're all imperfectly perfect, and we're all works in perpetual progress. Looking back on my life, some of the most painful periods have yielded some of the greatest learning. Some of you may be aware that I've been through my own dark nights of the soul two times in the past 15 years. Diagnosed with a benign brain tumor at the beginning of 2008, which was removed late 2010, and also faced with chronic health challenges, I emerged from two very deep depressions. And while these challenges brought up a lot of fear and anxiety in me about my future created significant financial hardship for a time. The end result was a profound well of empathy and compassion for all those who are struggling with their health, struggling with their finances, their relationships, and an incredible amount of empathy and compassion for everyone on the planet. And what can we do to move in a direction that will result in more joy, peace, and happiness and satisfaction? Well, let's revisit unity principle number three. We create our life experiences through our way of thinking. See, when I was back in my 20s, I mean, I started this, this quest in my teens. But back in my 20s, I became aware of the following. Everything I create in my life is a result of my thinking and where I place my focus. And I've read countless books on the subject, listened to CD programs, watched movies and videos, attended so many seminars, all the way increasing my knowledge. Back in 2015, I had the good fortune to learn the following when I started listening to a CD program that I still listen to. Spending time every day actively thinking and visualizing what you want to generate in your life while feeling the most positive emotions attracts that very thing into your life. Now, here's the one caveat that no one really ever talks about that I also discovered. The only thing that can derail the power of positive visualization is doubt. I'm going to say that again. The only thing that can stop the power of positive visualization is doubt, even the smallest doubt. This practice, a core unity principle, encourages and empowers you to take control of your transformation. So to dive deeper into this, this focusing on positive things, there are three different ways you can visualize what you desire. Three different ways that, that all work. So option one, the first way, you can visualize what you want to attract with great specificity. I'd like the following career in a certain city with a certain company, and then feel all the positive emotions you'd feel as if you had landed that career. Or option two, you can visualize a general concept of what you want to attract. You want a, a specific career, but you're not concerned with the company or city. And as an option one, you feel the positive emotions as if you already were working that job or career. And option three, this one 
brings the greatest result. Hold an idea of what you're wanting. For example, the career. Focus all your energy, attention on feeling good all the time while you're holding that idea. This way, God and the universe will bring you the absolute best result tailor-made for you. This is the one that I used when I found the house that I was in in 2015. I just said to myself, I needed to find a new house to rent and I was driving around and I just said to myself, every time I see a house when I'm driving around that I'll like, that looks like it would be a great house for me, I'll just say, yes, yes, yes. And I actually temporarily moved into uh, a friend's place the beginning of June had sent out hundreds of flyers in May with no results, found an ad on Craigslist, and this house was actually right down the street from where I lived previously. So allowing the universe to bring you what's best for you, it works. Here are some things you can do both when you feel good and also when you're feeling challenged. Because Let's face it, it's an incredible challenge to feel good all the time. Life happens. So number one, adopt an attitude of gratitude. As soon as you wake up in the morning and right before you go to sleep at night, think of 10 things that you're grateful for. Two, eat good, healthy food as close as possible to how nature intended it. If you have a choice between canned peas and the real thing, choose the real thing. Canned peaches and the real thing, choose the real thing. Do your best to limit processed foods. Three, exercise. Go for a walk each day, at least 20 minutes. And if you can, walk for an hour and look at things out on the horizon, far away. Four, read positive and uplifting books. Even a page a day can make a difference. Watch uplifting movies, both fiction and nonfiction. Five, go on a news fast and stay on it. And I just want to say something here. One of the things that's really helped guide me is when I find myself attracted to news or something that's negative, I just ask myself, geez, how is this making me feel in this moment? How is focusing on that making me feel? That allows me to pivot. Usually ends up in turning off the news in the car radio when I'm driving home or turning off, just closing an article on social media. Number six, hug someone. Studies have shown that people who hug are healthier than those who don't. It's been one of the most difficult things about this pandemic. One study linked more frequent hugs to lowered blood pressure and heart rate. Heart rate. Number seven, laugh. Laughter is the absolute best medicine. Years ago, a man named Norman Cousins wrote Anatomy of an Illness. Norman received a grave diagnosis of only six weeks to live. So what did he do? He chose to watch the funniest of movies all day and literally laughed himself back to health. When the doctors repeated the test and scan six weeks later, there was zero trace of the disease in his body. Number eight, smile all day long. I do this and sometimes people get suspicious or wigged out, but I do it. Smile at everyone you meet. Nine, practice self-care. Get a massage or take a sauna. Swap mat massages with a friend or a partner. Here's number 10, get a pet. Izzy and I just fostered a wonderful tuxedo cat whose name is Mila. She brings so much joy and love into our house. 11, optional but highly recommended for everyone. The amount of toxins that we're exposed to, consuming, breathing is unprecedented. It's unprecedented in these times detox and cleanse if you have health issues even if you're in perfectly good health start the process of cleansing and detox you can speak to the health section of your natural food grocery store here in south surrey it's choices or nature's fair 
for recommendations on detoxes and cleanses, you can also speak to me. 12, spend more time in nature. Go for a walk in the woods. In Japan, this is known as forest bathing or ecotherapy, and it's prescribed regularly and is scientifically proven to improve health. And it's not very hard here in South Surrey to find a nice forest or trail to walk on. It's been said that disconnection from nature is one of the greatest factors contributing to all the challenges we face as a species, which includes health. This is also why you saw during the pandemic on hiking trails, so many people were hiking because they just needed to get out into nature. Number 13, perceived divinity in everything. When one knows that everything on the planet and out in the universe is sacred. Every being, every rock, every tree, every star, every planet. Seeing the divine in all opens us up to new possibilities. Number 14, do your best to let go of all judgments, people, situations. You know, when I find myself judging someone, I ask myself, have I ever done that, what I'm actually judging? And more often than not, I find that I have done it. I mean, in conversations with God, this resonates strongly. Conversations with God, which re resonates very strongly with unity, one of the profound principles concerning judgment has been that has liberated me is the following. No one does anything inappropriate given their model of the world. And I'll repeat that. No one does anything inappropriate given their model of the world. A supreme challenge for many of us, including me, but releasing judgment opens the space for transformation. To conclude, I believe it serves us to view transformation as a never ending journey rather than a destination. We can take charge of our transformation by living, by living unity principle number three. We create, our, we create our life experiences through our way of thinking. Thank you. This song is called Little Shoes. Um, I recorded it, a single, uh, a few years ago. And uh, I've played it every Father's Day at Unity for the past uh, two years. This is the third year. Here we go. Riding high upon my horse All bravado, no remorse Foolish pride precedes a fall In a heartbeat lost it all Oh, when life beat me down not a soul to be found. I headed home, shed my blues when I saw their little shoes. Did not feel us grow. When you left it broke my heart But my little angels have their love For a silver lining from above Oh, 
and life beat me down. Not a soul to be found. Headed home, I shed my blues when I saw them. Carving lives out of their own. But those little angels and their love. Still a silver line from mother. Cause when light beat me down, not a soul to be found. Headed home, I shed my shoes when I saw their little shoes.